maritime disasters. But none have caught the public imagination in such a dramatic and lasting way as that of the Titanic. She was the pride of her company, the White Star Line. She was the biggest ship in the world. Yet her collision with an iceberg on her fateful maiden voyage and her sinking with the loss of some 1,500 lives sealed her place in history. The tragic events of April 1912 are unforgettable. Never again would men feel so confident in technology. It was claimed in the press that she was unsinkable, and her sinking left valuable lessons to be learned. The legend of the Titanic lives on and grows with each retelling. But let's return to the early years of the century and trace the birth of this great liner and her sister ships, for she was one of three. In the Edwardian era, Britain was building 50% of the world's merchant ships. Her shipbuilding and railway engineering were unsurpassed throughout the world, and her worldwide possessions made the British Empire, the greatest the world had ever seen, the empire on which the sun never set. The most lucrative trading route was that with North America, and the North Atlantic became both the major sea route and the most important for passenger trade. At that time, there were no restrictions on emigrants from Europe entering the New World, and thousands made the crossing. Britain vied, chiefly with Germany, to build the biggest, fastest, and most luxurious liners, and so capture both the well-to-do travelers and the bread-and-butter emigrant trade. By 1906, Germany had both the largest liner the Kaiserin August Victoria at 24,581 tons and the fastest, the Kaiser Wilhelm II with a speed of 23.6 knots. Britain outshone them both in 1907 with the Cunard liners Lusitania and Mauritania, both at 32,000 tons and speeds of over 26 knots. They were built with subsidies from the Admiralty who wanted to regain British prestige and prevent Cunard from being taken over by an American combine, the International Mercantile Marine Company, the IMM. The subsidy also meant the two liners could be adapted in time of war as armed merchant cruisers. Already under American financial control was the Oceanic Steam Navigation Company, more popularly known as the White Star Line. This company had opted out of the race to build the fastest liners and chose comfort and safety as their priorities. The American backing enabled the company to embark on an ambitious plan to produce a trio of liners to provide a weekly Atlantic service. They would be the largest, most luxurious and safest ships in the world, 50% larger than the Cunard giants. They were to be called Olympic, Titanic, and Gigantic, the last being eventually named Britannic. On July the 1st, 1907, the order for the first two ships was placed with Harland and Wolfe of Belfast. They were given the shipyard numbers 400 and 401. Major changes were needed at the Queen's Island shipyard. Three existing slipways were demolished and two new ones laid in their place. These were straddled by a gantry giving clear spaces of a hundred feet between rows of supporting towers. The 840 feet long gantry was surmounted by a mobile crane with a span of 135 feet and lifting capacity of three tons. Six mobile frames each carried ten radial cranes, with lifts and ramps to transport men and materials to the various levels of construction. A large floating crane was purchased from Germany, and the construction of a new dry dock commenced. 
The number of employees at the shipyard doubled to 11,300 during the building and fitting out of the two immense liners. The designer of the ships was Thomas Andrews. He was the nephew of Lord Pirrie, chairman of Harland and Wolfe, and was a well-connected member of Irish society. He worked with his deputy, Edward Wilding, using a drawing office full of draftsmen and a huge model of the proposed class of ship. The keel of the Olympic was laid on January the 1st, 1909, and that of the Titanic on March the 16th. The construction of the two massive hulls progressed apace. The Olympic a few months ahead of the Titanic, to ease pressure on the shipyard production shops. On October the 20th, 1910, the Olympic was launched. She was painted grey to allow press photographers better views of the liner and the launch took just 62 seconds. She was then towed to the new deep water quay for fitting out, leaving the black painted Titanic still caged in her surrounding gantry. These new vessels were designed to have service speeds of 21 knots. The engines generated 55,000 horsepower. Cunard had opted for marine turbines to propel their record breakers, but Harland and Wolfe adopted their favorite combination, reciprocating engines to drive the two 23 feet 6 inch diameter outer propellers, the steam from which then exhausted into a low pressure turbine which turned the ahead only 16 feet 6 inch center propeller, providing steam for the engines with 24 double and 5 single ended boilers containing 159 furnaces. Seven months after her launch, the great ship was ready, and after two days of successful sea trials, the Olympic finally left Belfast on May the 31st, 1911. This was a brilliantly timed publicity exercise, as the Titanic herself was finally launched on that same day. For this occasion, the landward end of the building gantry was decked with one Union Jack and one Stars and Stripes, with a white star pennant in the center, below which code flags spelled out success. About 100,000 people watched as, just after quarter past noon, the liner, urged on by hydraulic rams, slid backwards into the River Lagan. There was little ceremony, as was the White Star custom. Later, when the Britannic was launched, a retired shipyard worker recalled, they just builds them and chucks them in. In just 62 seconds, she slid into the water and was brought to a halt by the tons of drag chains attached by cables along her hull. The following day, June the 1st, her sister ship anchored in the Mersey off Liverpool the traditional home and port of registration of the White Star Line. It was her only visit to the Mersey, for she then headed for Southampton, the line's main port since 1907, where the London and South Western Railway had built a new large dock to accommodate this new class of wonder ship, twice the size of the 20,000-ton liners the port had become used to. The dock, known as the White Star Dock until the late 1920s, is 1,700 feet long, 400 feet wide, enclosing 16 acres of water. It was later to be used by such liners as the Queen Mary, the Queen Elizabeth, and eventually the new QE2. Harland and Wolfe had built a ship repair works at Southampton but major repairs would have to be done in the new dry dock back at Belfast. The Olympic set sail on her maiden voyage at noon on Wednesday, June the 14th. Her captain was Edward John Smith, their premier Atlantic captain and destined for command of her sister ship. Also on board was J. Bruce Ismay, the company's managing director. He was preparing a meticulous report on the ship's layout, fittings and service, and many alterations to these provisions were subsequently made on the Titanic. The biggest changes were to be on bridge deck B, with luxurious parlor suites extending to the ship's side, 
thus removing the promenade for much of its length and increasing the gross tonnage by 1,004 tons. The reception hall by the aft grand stairway, a large restaurant with sea views, and a cafe parisien, complete with trellis work and growing ivy. Both ships had electric lifts, swimming baths, the first afloat, Turkish baths, squash courts and gymnasia. But the Titanic acquired the reputation of being more luxurious because of these many improvements. Richly carved panelling, stained glass windows, deeply piled carpets and many other fitments of both luxury and necessity were bringing the Titanic to completion. She would be a floating palace. But completion, and ultimately the date of her maiden voyage, was delayed, owing to the return of the Olympic to Belfast following a collision near Southampton with the cruiser HMS Hawk on September the 20th. The Hawk's bow was badly damaged. The hole in the Olympic was 40 feet high and extended 8 feet into the ship. There was a second hole at the waterline caused by the cruiser's beak-like ram. Some witnesses claimed the huge bulk of the liner caused an undertow which sucked the smaller ship into her side. This phenomenon was later to cause a near accident on the Titanic's departure from Southampton. The Olympic was taken to the new dry dock at Belfast, and men were taken from fitting out the Titanic to speed the repairs. On February the 24th, 1912, Olympic returned again for repairs to a propeller. Eventually, following these delays, and 11 months after her launching, the Titanic was at last ready for sea trials. One final modification had been to enclose and glaze her forward promenade on A deck. On Olympic, this section of promenade was prone to wetting by spray. This gave the Titanic a visual feature distinguishing her from her sister. Trials began on June the 2nd in the Irish Sea under the command of her captain, Edward John Smith, who had left the Olympic in Southampton and travelled to Belfast. He had taken his finest and final command and took the ship on to Southampton. Still with last-minute interior work in progress, she was not opened to the public for inspection, as was the custom. The ship was thoroughly inspected by a Board of Trade representative. The brand new lifeboats were lowered and rowed around in the dock to the inspector's satisfaction before being hauled back on board. They were maneuvered by the well-in type of davit, and although these could each handle several boats in succession during an emergency, the actual number of lifeboats fitted on the Titanic complied to a Board of Trade ruling made 20 years earlier. This stated that a ship of 10,000 tons or over a large ship in the late 19th century should carry 16 lifeboats. But the Titanic was 46,000 tons. White Star, in fact, provided four extra in the form of Engelhardt collapsible boats with planked bottoms and collapsible canvas sides. The number of passengers was not considered, just the letter of the law. In fact, this was only half the number of lifeboats required to accommodate a full complement of passengers and crew in the event of a disaster. Captain Smith was the White Star's senior captain. For many years he had taken White Star vessels on their maiden voyages. He was born on the 27th of January, 1850, in Hanley, Stoke-on-Trent. He was the son of Edward Smith, a potter and later a greengrocer, and Catherine Smith. He was educated at Etruria British School, one of the first day schools in the Potteries. One of his first jobs 
was as a steam hammer operator at Etruria Forge, but he left the area at the age of 21 to join the mercantile marine. His progress was so swift that he captained his first ship when he was 24 years old. In an outstanding career, he eventually became commander and commodore of the White Star Line. His employers had absolute faith in his skill and judgment. His career had been unblemished by any accident apart from the incident on the Olympic. He was a tall, distinguished, quietly spoken man, and coming up to retirement, the Titanic was to be the pinnacle of his career. Since January 1912, the country had been in the grip of a coal strike, causing many liners to be laid up and putting 17,000 men out of work in Southampton. By April, the strike was on its last legs, but to enable the Titanic to set sail, coal had to be taken off other ships laid up in the docks. The White Stars, Oceanic and Majestic, and the New York, Philadelphia, St. Louis and St. Paul of the American Line. On Wednesday, April the 10th, hundreds of passengers and crewmen boarded the Titanic. It was a bright, sunny day. The boat train from London brought the well-to-do, including the millionaire Benjamin Guggenheim and William Stead, editor of the Pall Mall Gazette, who was going to America on the invitation of President Taft to deliver a speech at the World Peace Conference on April the 22nd. All levels of society were represented on this palace ship. Some passengers were transferred from the laid-up IMM ships. Eva Hart and her family were originally booked on the Philadelphia. We were booked in a ship called the Philadelphia. And this coal strike came and she didn't sail. And we were then offered a berth in the Titanic, which absolutely delighted my father. I thought it was wonderful. The whole world was talking about that ship. And my mother had this dreadful premonition. She'd never had one before and she never had one after. But she said, no, we, we, we can't do this. It's quite wrong. Something dreadful will happen. And I, I tell you what the sort of woman she was, she'd got both feet on the ground and for her to behave like that was absolutely unbelievable to everyone. But she just had that premonition. I'm a seven. I'd read there was a big ship. It didn't really convey as much to us as it did to my parents. Obviously. I mean, I, I'd never been in a ship at all before, so it didn't convey very much to me. But I do know everyone was talking about it. At noon, the ropes holding the liner to the quay were cast off, and six tugs slowly pulled her away from the quay. There were cheers from the assembled crowd, the waving of handkerchiefs, and the shouting of last-minute messages between ship and shore. The Titanic moved out into the river test and began to move under her own steam, her three screws powerfully pushing her 46,000 tons slowly forward. But she displaced such an amount of water in the channel that the line in New York, moored alongside the Oceanic, broke her moorings and drifted out sternwards towards the giant ship. Captain Smith and pilot George Bowyer stopped the central propeller and ordered the outer propellers to be set at full astern. This stopped the New York when she was only 12 feet from the Titanic stern and brought the great ship herself to rest. The tug Vulcan placed herself between the vessels, had ropes thrown onto the New York and as the Titanic now moved backwards a little, towed the New York round the dockhead corner into the river Itchen and out of trouble. This near collision was seen by many as a bad omen and put another, if only slight, delay in her departure. The liner proceeded down Southampton water, passing Hythe to starboard and western shore Netley with its ruined abbey and huge military hospital to port. She passed the mouth of the river Hamble and finally rounded Cowshot Spit and then into the Solent. In 
glorious sunshine, the Titanic sailed out past Cowes and the Isle of Wight and into the open sea towards Cherbourg, where she was to arrive at 6.30 p.m. to take on more bags of mail and passengers. These included more millionaires, such as John Jacob Astor and his wife, and various socialites, some seeing the maiden voyage of the world's largest liner as a good way to end their European holidays. Now she turned westwards through the English Channel to call at Queenstown, now Cove, in Ireland, just before noon on April the 11th. More mailbags were taken on, and some mail and passengers delivered to the Irish port. Remaining on board the Titanic, the 322 first-class passengers, 277 second-class, and 709 third-class, making her about half full, and 898 crew members. 3,814 sacks of mail had been loaded, and this would partly be sorted in the Titanic's own post office. She weighed anchor at 1.30 p.m., and headed out into the Atlantic towards New York. Life on board an ocean liner consisted of eating and occupying one's time between meals as best one could. The first-class passengers had the ship's five-man band, led by Wallace Hartley, to entertain them. Hartley had previously played on the Mauritania and other prestigious liners. The band played everything from Strauss and Offenbach for the stately Jacobean room to ragtime and cakewalks for afternoon dances. A separate trio played in the restaurant's reception room and Café Parisienne. A piano was provided for the use of the third class and an Irish piper and fiddler would play for their communal dancing. Ball games in the forward and aft well decks were popular with the third class. These could be seen by spectators from the other classes on the tiers of decks above them. These others had space enough for deck tennis, shuffleboard or promenades round the wide boat deck. Inside, there were first and second class libraries and games rooms. To cater for over 2,000 people at sea for six days, head chef Mr. C. Proctor had stored inboard 75,000 pounds of various meats, 25,000 pounds of poultry, including quail, pheasant, chicken, turkey and plover, 15,000 bottles of beer and 1,000 of wine, 1,000 pounds of tea, 2,200 pounds of coffee and tons of fruit, vegetables, jams, and other items. In third class, the food was basic but plentiful. People said that third class on the Titanic was as good as first class on any other liner. There were two dining rooms for first class, a Jacobean room and an a la carte restaurant with the adjoining Café Parisienne, the latter two being run by Monsieur Gatti and his staff on behalf of the White Star Line. A bugler sounded the call for dinner in the evening. During the voyage, the weather remained fine, the sea calm, but with a chilling breeze. It was to get colder on Sunday, April the 14th. In the radio room, ship-to-shore contact was made possible again as the ship came in range of Cape Race, and the operators were kept busy with current messages and the backlog which had built up through a breakdown of the system two days previously. Ice warnings had been received during Sunday by the two Marconi operators in the radio room, Jack Phillips and his assistant, Harold Bride. Their prime job was to transmit and receive private messages, known as Marconigrams, stock exchange information and news. These private messages bringing the company its revenue. Official messages received for the ship 
indicated that there was pack ice and large and small icebergs in the shipping lanes, although it was not appreciated that these warnings represented one huge ice field. Messages to the ship itself were pinned on a notice board for the information of the navigating officers, but not all the ice warnings were posted. An 11 a.m. warning had read, America passed two large icebergs in 41 degrees 27 minutes north, 50 degrees 8 minutes west, on the 14th of April. A message received from the Masaba at 9.40 p.m. stated, Ice report in latitude 42 degrees to 41 degrees 25 minutes north, longitude 49 degrees to 50 degrees 30 minutes west. Saw much heavy pack ice and great number large icebergs, also field ice. Weather good, clear. Assistant operator Harold Bride was off duty, but chief operator Jack Phillips was snowed under with sending and receiving private messages. He put this later message to one side for subsequent delivery to the bridge. He was not to know that this message warned of ice directly in the path of the Titanic. At 11 p.m., the Leyland liner, Californian, was not far away, stopped and blocked in by ice. During the course of the evening, Phillips rebuked the Marconi operator on the Californian for interrupting his calls to Cape Race. Later, as he came off duty, the Californian's wireless operator switched off his set and turned in for the night. Captain Smith had been to a dinner party held in his honor in the restaurant. He returned to the bridge at 9 p.m. He discussed the weather and ice warnings with second officer Charles Herbert Lightoller. After 20 minutes, he went into the chart room, leaving instructions for him to be called if conditions deteriorated. Lightoller went off duty at 10 o'clock, handing over to First Officer Murdoch. Lightoller went to bed just before 11.30 after making his rounds of the ship. Up in the crow's nest, lookouts Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee were looking ahead in the bitterly cold wind. At 11.40 p.m., Fleet rang the crow's nest bell three times and picked up the telephone connecting him with the bridge. Iceberg right ahead, he called. He described what he saw. The berg came ever closer. The ship then responded to Murdoch's emergency instructions. Harder starboard. Full astern. Harder port. The prow swung slowly across, and the iceberg passed along the starboard side of the ship before disappearing aft. It seemed like a near miss. But the iceberg had bumped along the ship's hull below the waterline, shearing off rivet heads, penetrating parts of the hull, and opening overlapping plate seams. A gash of between 250 and 300 feet long had been made below the waterline along the front part of the starboard hull. The whole impact had taken only 10 seconds. Many people on board didn't even notice the event. Others reported feeling a slight vibration. Some people came up on deck to see why the ship was now stopping. And on the third class deck, men were seen playing football in the forward well deck, with some of the ice which had fallen from the towering berg as she passed. There was no clue to the imminent disaster. Captain Smith had rushed to the bridge and checked that all the electrically operated emergency watertight doors below had been closed and ordered a quick inspection of the ship. It was only then that the enormity of the damage to her hull became apparent. The Titanic was divided into 16 watertight compartments and could float with any two possibly three or four of them, completely flooded. But this long, glancing blow meant that the six forward compartments were flooding. The bulkheads this far from the prow 
only reached up to the saloon deck, some lower still. And as the ship was weighed down with the seawater flooding in and began to sink by the head, the water would rise above these compartments to fill the next, and the next, and so on. It was inevitable that the Titanic would sink. Thomas Andrews, the ship's designer, confirmed this to Captain Smith. But still, the passengers were unaware of their imminent peril. I was in bed, of course. And she just came and joined in whatever was happening during the evening, and that sort of thing. And my father got very cross because he had every reason to dislike gambling. His father had been a compulsive gambler and had died utterly penniless from being quite a wealthy man. And so everybody was gambling on this Sunday night. They were making books, I think the term is, and having sweepstakes as to what time she would get in so many minutes past so and so. My father would have nothing to do with it. And so he went to bed quite early, for him anyway. And my mother sat down to sew and read. And she looked up at him, he was reading, he said he'd got a very interesting book. But quite quickly, he went to sleep and she got up and took the book from him and set her down again. And she said at 10 minutes to 12, she felt a slight bump. And she said it was just like a train pulling into a station. It just jerked. It was very slight, but she said she knew that it was this dreadful something and she wakened my father. She wakened me and my father said no, he wasn't going up on deck again after the night before. But she literally pulled him out of bed and made him go up. And she then said she was going to dress me and I being sleepy and very naughty said I wasn't going to be dressed, nothing to be dressed for, I came back to bed. My father came back very quickly because he could get up to the boat deck in the lift very quickly from where our cabin was. And um, he came back and he picked me up and wrapped his blanket tightly around me as if I were a baby. And my mother said nothing to him and I used to say to her sometimes, years afterwards, I can't understand why you didn't say to him what was it, which she certainly did not say. And she said I didn't have to say what was it, I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was this dreadful something that I had to live with for months and there was nothing more I could say. So he put his very thick coat on her and put another one on himself. And without any words at all, we went out of the cabin and into the lift and up onto the boat deck. Now, if we hadn't done that at that time, I very much doubt I'd be talking to you today because, as you know, there were less than, there was accommodation for less than 800 people in the lifeboats and she was carrying 2,200. So it was a question as who was there in time to get into one of the all too few lifeboats. Well, they weren't launched very quickly because at first no one thought anything was going to happen. But my father went away and spoke to an officer and he said, um, they are going to launch lifeboats, but you'll all be back on board for breakfast. Now began the general alert. Runners called through the ship for passengers to put their life jackets on and proceed up onto the decks. Some still thought this was merely a safety practice, even at near midnight. What distinguished this operation in its early stages was the quiet orderliness, with people remaining on the whole quite calm. It was a cold, clear, starlit night as people filled the decks. Those in the upper classes arriving before the greater numbers of third-class passengers who were berthed furthest away from the boat deck. The sea was a flat calm, but Captain Smith knew there would only be enough space in the lifeboats for half the people on board. Down in the Marconi room, the captain ordered the operators to stand by, then returned a few minutes later at 12.15 a.m. to tell them to send the international distress call CQD. The position was estimated as 41 degrees 46 minutes north, 50 degrees 24 minutes west. At 12.25, this was changed to 41 degrees 46 minutes north, 50 degrees 14 minutes west, the revised signal being picked up by the liner Carpathia nearly 60 miles away. She immediately altered course and steamed towards the stricken giant. 
Just after 12.30, Captain Smith again came to the wireless room and asked what they were sending. CQD, Phillips replied. Harold Bride joked, Send SOS, it's the new call. It may be your last chance to send it. Shortly after, the first lifeboat was lowered, containing only 19 or 20 people. No lifeboat drill had been given to passengers at any time on the voyage, and many crew were unclear about their lifeboat stations. But then Quartermaster Rowe began firing off distress rockets at five-minute intervals, and people were now less reluctant to climb into the lifeboats being prepared for lowering. The evacuation of the ship now ceased to be so calm and orderly. There wasn't any panic until the lifeboats left, and then there was panic galore. We were down on the ocean, we could hear them running about on the decks and screaming. You can imagine people came up from their cabin, went onto the deck, no lifeboat, tearing around the other side. That's when the panic was there. There wasn't any panic at the time I got the lifeboat because there weren't enough people up there. And were there enough people there to just get into the lifeboats? But after that, when the others started coming up from their cabins and there were no boats, gosh, there was panic, we could hear it. Definitely. The ship's band, led by Wallace Hartley, had been playing inside the liner. Now they moved out onto the deck and, almost incongruously, played jaunty ragtime tunes. As each lifeboat reached the water, it moved away from the ship for fear of the suction should she sink. Some rowed towards the lights of a ship which could be seen just a few miles away. But this ship was never identified and never reached. And of course there, there are still um, threats of legal things even these days about whether the ship that was so close to us was the Californian or not. I mean, I saw that ship. It's terribly close. And the other thing I'm saying is that I didn't see a ship 19 miles away. I saw a ship that was so close. And they said at the time it was less than nine miles away. Now they're trying to say it was 19. Um, I saw it, you know, it wasn't just lights on the horizon, you could see it was a ship. And I saw our rockets being fired, which that ship must have seen. Well, this inquiry says that they did see it, but they didn't think it was a portent of danger. But I would have thought in the middle of the Atlantic, in the middle of the night, <laughs> that rockets must mean trouble. The Titanic's bow sank lower and lower in the water. Yet all her lights remained ablaze throughout, until very near the end. With great courage, every one of the liner's engineers stayed at his post in the bowels of the ship to keep the pumps, lights, wireless and other functions operational. Women and children first was the rule for the lifeboats, but some men were allowed in as boats were hurriedly lowered and no ladies could be seen close by. J. Bruce Ismay, managing director of White Star, himself stepped into a partially filled boat. First and second class passengers were led to the boat deck. Third class had to find their own ways as best they could. At 1.30 a group rushed boat 14 as she was about to be lowered, and 5th officer Lowe had to fire his revolver along the side of the ship to quell them. At 1.40 a.m. the last rocket was fired. The last of the rigid lifeboats was lowered at 1.55, the boat deck now only 15 feet above sea level instead of her usual 62 feet. Two of the collapsible boats were successfully launched. A third was launched at five past two, by which time the forecastle was underwater and promenade deck A was awash. At about this time, Thomas Andrews, who had designed this great ship, was last seen standing in the first-class smoking room. He was standing, arms folded, life jacket off, staring straight ahead at a painting above the mantelpiece, The Approach to Plymouth Harbour by Norman Wilkinson. Captain Smith released the wireless operators from their duties, but Phillips carried on sending distress messages while the power held out. The captain then walked along the deck telling his men it's every man for himself. Incredibly, the light still burned. At ten past two, she lurched and sank deeper. 
the last collapsible lifeboat, and some men were washed off the deckhouse, and this lifeboat B landed upside down in the water, with no chance of righting it. Men clambered to at least stand on the upturned hull. The band now played a solemn air. Some say autumn, but popular belief says it was nearer my God to thee. Well, there's no question about the fact that they played, and there's no question about the fact that, that after we were down on the water and they were playing, they played one um, version of the hymn, Near My God to Thee, of which there are three. I've had this out so many times. And the one they played was the one that was played in church some months after when I was with my grandmother, and I was so frightened I came out of church, I ran out, I knew the tune so well. But they won't have it, the Americans won't have it. And people say, no, no, it's not it, but it was just rain time, but it wasn't. It wasn't. Now the stern rose out of the water. Two four-inch diameter cable stays snapped, and the forward funnel crashed down to starboard, crushing the bridge wing and killing several people in the water. The wash it generated pushed the upturned lifeboat away from the ship. There were varying reports on how Captain Smith met his end. One claimed he committed suicide on the bridge with his revolver. Another that he swam up to a lifeboat with a baby in his arms, put the baby in the boat, then sank beneath the waves. And another that he simply went down with his ship. Perhaps he too had been killed by the collapsing funnel. But others say he swam towards the upturned collapsible lifeboat before turning away and disappearing in the darkness. Fifteen hundred people were still on board as now the bridge submerged. The stern rose higher in the air. Those in the lifeboats heard the terrible crashing sounds as boilers broke loose from their seatings and crashed down through the vessel, along with many tons of coal, baggage, and all the loose furniture and fittings of the great ship. At the same time, her lights went out, flashed once more, and then were finally extinguished. Now at least a hundred feet of her stern rose to a near vertical position, which she held for a considerable time, silhouetted against the stars on the calm, clear night. The visible part of the ship apparently settled back slightly before it, too, disappeared beneath the sea. It was this settling that indicated the ship had broken in two. And we rowed away uh, from the ship as fast as we could, because one has to do that, because I believe the suction when a vessel goes down is absolutely enormous. And we rowed away, and I didn't close my eyes at all. I saw that ship sink. And I saw that ship break in half. And for so many years, people have argued with me about that. But now at last it has been proven beyond all doubt that she did break in half. I know she did, I saw her. And the forepart went down nose first and the other. The stern of that ship stood up in the water for quite a long time, or it seemed a long time to me, and then keeled over. And we heard the dreadful sound of people drowning, which was, oh, unbelievable. And then, because our lifeboat was so full, so over full, the officer called all the boats together and transhipped some of us. One in that boat and two in that and three in that and I got separated from my mother. And uh, that was the most terrifying thing to happen to a child. But the most dreadful sound of all is the sound of people drowning. The screams. Absolutely ghastly. My mother used to say sometimes, she couldn't get me to talk about it for years, but if ever I did, anyone did talk to me, I said that, she used to say yes. But do you remember the silence that followed it? And that's quite right, it's, the whole world stood still that night. Once the lights had gone, the ship had gone, the sound had gone. That was dreadful. dreadful. Now there was nothing to do but wait for rescue. Among those standing on the upturned boat was Harold Bride, the wireless operator, who confirmed to his companions that the Carpathia was on her way. At 3.30 a.m., she was sighted on the horizon, firing rockets. And at 4.30, she was on the scene. The 
Carpathia arrived with the door, and by 8.30 had taken on board 705 survivors and 14 lifeboats, the rest being set adrift. And uh, we were picked up, as you know, in the morning by this little ship, the Carpathia, and the rescue uh, of people from lifeboats in mid-ocean is quite a terrifying thing. These little boats, shall we say, draw up alongside, for want of a better expression, to what looks like an enormous vessel. She was quite a small vessel, the, Car the Carpathia, but she looked a pig from there. And then how do you get on board? You don't have a gangplank like you do when you're ashore. And so they opened a, a, a sort of, I don't know whether the word is right, a hatch in the side of the ship where the luggage used to be laid. And um, they threw down rope ladders and people like my mother and other grown-ups had to climb up in mid-ocean up a swaying rope ladder, rope ladder, which she said was the most terrifying thing. A sailor behind sort of holding on. And then how, what couldn't the children do? We couldn't climb up a rope ladder. So they got these big luggage nets and the mesh is very wide apart. It's quite a big mesh. Children would have slipped through it, small children. Anyway, our legs and feet would have gone through it. So each child was put in a sack. And I remember being petrified when I was put in that sack and it was tied around and the sack full of these children were put into these huge nets and quite safely, of course, hauled aboard. But that really was quite terrifying. Then having got on board, of course, I couldn't find my mother. And I didn't find her for hours, but eventually I found her. And I'm quite sure one of the most pathetic things must have been the whole of the next day, how these poor women, such as my mother, my mother, roamed about the ship looking to see if they could see the husband they left behind. But no one found anyone. En route to New York, Captain Rostron only allowed official and personal messages to be sent from the ship by radio. Newspapers, thus denied hard copy, made up their own fanciful accounts of the disaster. It was only on arrival that the true story became known and gradually the dreadful news of the disaster was released to the world. Memorial services were held on both sides of the Atlantic, while the crew were detained under virtual arrest until the official inquiries were carried out, their pay having been stopped from the moment of sinking. Controversy reigned over who was to blame, and whether the nearby ship, the Californian, could indeed have rescued everyone on board if only her wireless operator hadn't closed down his set 20 minutes before the collision with the iceberg. The lookouts certainly saw and counted the rockets, but thought these might have been company signals used for identification purposes on ships still not fitted with radio, and they also appeared to be too low for a ship reportedly so near. The American inquiry placed blame for the disaster on J. Bruce Ismay, the fact that the Titanic was sailing at virtually full speed, 21 knots, at the time of collision, knowing there were icebergs in the area, and the lack of sufficient lifeboats. The English inquiry also blamed the speed and inadequate provision of lifeboats, but also cited Captain Smith. After this tragedy, ships were to travel on a more southerly Atlantic route, travelled slower and always had lifeboat provision for all on board. 63% of the Titanic's first-class passengers survived, 42% of second-class and 25% of third-class. 23% of the crew were saved, 705 in all, leaving 1,500 to perish in the icy seas of the North Atlantic. But the press of the day concentrated not so much on the loss of life and who was to blame, but on how British and American values of heroism, honor, and courage 
had been upheld throughout the tragedy. Men behaved as men should do. All heroes, every one. And on Captain Smith's reputed last words, be British. This was the cry as the ship went down. Every man was heavy at his post. Captain and crew when they knew the war. For over 70 years, the Titanic lay undiscovered in the depths of the Atlantic. There were fanciful ideas that she would still be intact, that corrosion would be minimal as she was at such a great depth, that she could be refloated. On September the 1st, 1985, the American naval research vessel Knorr from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution discovered her. The Titanic had been found after 73 years. The scientist in charge was Dr. Ballard, and many fascinating photographs and video pictures were taken on this and a subsequent visit to the site in July 1986. The liner is broken into two main sections, but sits upright with her funnels gone. She is severed just aft of her second funnel, and the stern section is 800 meters away. Much of the central section lies in shattered segments on the seabed. A silver memorial plaque has been left on the wreck as a mark of respect and to honor her as an official grave to the hundreds who perished with her, and as a tribute to a disaster which should never have happened. I entirely agree with my dear Dr. Ballard's words. He said the whole thing was a tribute to man's arrogance, and I agree with that. The man can be so arrogant as to build something and claim that it is undestroyable, if you like. It's, it's the most arrogant thing to say. True, if the Titanic had struck rocks or a tempest and storm and sunk, that would be one thing, but this was a ship that needn't have had any loss of lives. That, I think, is the most dreadful part of it. And as I say, all these years later, this interest is profound. And it's because there was no need for anyone to die. No one should have died. Had she had enough lifeboats with two and a half hours and a very smooth sea, nobody would have died. And one life is worth more than the whole ship, surely. That is what I saw, that is what I remember. And there are hardly any of us now to share this memory, of course. I'm the only living survivor now that can remember it and um, get about, so to speak. I don't think it's anyone that can really tell the whole story of it, except myself.